I felt inspired, if not compelled, to discuss this subject in light of current events, the situation in the Middle East as of November 2023. Not because this subject is topical, no. It is precisely because this subject isn't topical. In September of 2023, the unrecognised Armenian Republic of Artsakh surrendered to Azerbaijan. Consequently, over 100,000 Armenians were ethnically cleansed from Nagorno-Karabakh, a region where Armenians had dwelt for millennia. This major historical event received only token coverage in the Western media, before quickly passing out of the news cycle, in scandalous contrast to the events currently unfolding in Gaza. This is typical of Western coverage of Armenia. Worse, it is indicative of how the fate of Christians in the Middle East has been reduced to that of a mere historical footnote. The current Pope may warn that Christians in the Middle East may disappear due to murderous indifference, a sentiment echoed by his Orthodox counterpart in Constantinople. Yet, the political and journalistic indifference persists. I'm sure many of the people watching this video will have a conception of Christian history in the Middle East, but it is that of the Crusades in the Levant and the Outram Estates. Fair enough. That is an inescapable facet of medieval history, inspiring adoration and condemnation in equal measure. It is a rich and nuanced subject, one that should never fall out of historical fashion, so to speak. But has it occurred to anyone why this topic simply drops off after the fall of Jerusalem to Salah al-Din and the Third Crusade? Is it that all the Christians simply left, or died? If I were being conspiratorial, I might suggest that the enduring nature of the crusading narrative serves in part to perpetuate a victimhood narrative for Muslims and indeed Jews suffering under the yoke of Catholic Christendom, a victimhood narrative that loses currency with the fall of Jerusalem. I have covered the fate of the Byzantine Empire and Armenia elsewhere on this channel, where you can find various videos. If you want to find more about the Armenian Crusader overlap in Kilikia, there is a members-only video linked in the description. Armenia and the fate of the Anatolian Christians is a vital jumping-off point and companion in misery and doom with the rest of Oriental Christendom, but it is not today's focus. Here is a brief history of the Christians finding themselves foreigners in their own lands, Christians representing a panoply of denominations reflective of a diverse and ancient people predating the Muslim conquest, from the fall of Acre to modern day. The Agony of Middle Eastern Christendom, a history of religious persecution. What is now the core of the Middle East, the Levant and Egypt, the classical Roman diocese of the Orient, represents the cradle of Christianity in the most literal sense. After the coming of Christ, the first conscious assembly of Christians gathered in Antioch, ancient Syria, but what is now part of Hattay in modern Turkey. Of the five great patriarchates, the major episcopal sees, bishoprics and Christendom, three were situated in the Levant and Egypt, Jerusalem, Antioch and Alexandria. Antioch and Alexandria were the two great theological centres of early Christianity and sources of competing interpretations revolving around the true nature of Christ. What complicates the history of Middle Eastern Christendom from here is the sheer scale and complexity of religious division or schism. In 431, during the Council of Ephesus, the third ecumenical council, the followers of Nestorius were condemned 
after which they maintained a presence in the Persian Empire, even expanding further east, becoming the Nestorian Church. During the Fourth Council, that of Chalcedon, a more dramatic breach occurred. Chalcedon affirmed that Christ was both divine and human, with two natures represented in a single person. This definition, diophysitism, represented the position of the Antioch school of theology, and is the basis of Catholic, Orthodox and Protestant understanding today. Alexandria contrasted this definition with myophysitism, that Christ has one nature. Monophysites went a step further in arguing that Christ was fully divine, eschewing his human nature. The Myophysites formed the basis of the Oriental Orthodox churches, the Copts in Egypt, Armenia, Ethiopia and later Syria. Despite the early prominence of the Antioch school, after Chalcedon in the 6th century, the Syrian church of Antioch underwent schism, a situation that persists even today. While the Christian Eastern Roman Empire still ruled over the Levant and Egypt, the religious division was never resolved. The Emperor Heraclius was desperately seeking a compromise, even as the Arabs conquered the Christian heartlands. The Christians, politically and religiously fractured, now found themselves under the rule of Muslims. The Christians were already divided by language into three religious rites, Latin, Greek and Syriac. Syriac is a derivative of Aramaic, the language spoken by Christ, and the common vernacular language of ancient Syria and Mesopotamia. The decline of Syriac Christianity coincided with the decline of the Syriac language itself, as Arabic came to replace it as the lingua franca, the common tongue of Syria and Mesopotamia. The Christians were tolerated by their Muslim overlords on the condition that they paid the jizya, a religious tax, or perhaps tribute is a more apt expression in appreciating it as a method of subjugation. Nevertheless, under the Abbasid Caliphs of Islam, the Eastern Syriac Nestorian Church of the East briefly flourished and even expanded. Headquartered in Baghdad, the Abbasid capital, in the centre of their Mesopotamian heartland, the Nestorians retained their original bishops in Persia and sent missionaries east to India, Mongolia and even China inspiring the legend of Prester John, lord over the hidden Christian kingdom of the Orient. By the 10th century, the church boasted some 60 dioceses. And yet, as the once mighty Abbasid Caliphate destabilised, the Christians suffered, retreating to the highlands of Assyria and modern-day Lebanon. In Assyria, the Christians were subject to constant raiding, first by the Kurds and then by the Turks, both of whom would come to settle in the region. In Egypt, the Patriarch of Alexandria had ensured a peaceful transition from Byzantine rule to Muslim rule. At first, the application of the jizya encouraged many Egyptians to convert to Islam, depriving Coptic Christians of secular leadership. Immigration from Arabia reduced the relative number of Copts further, and the suppression of Coptic rebellions all ensured Muslim hegemony. There was a minority, the Copts were intermittently tolerated. The most dramatic exception to this was during the rule of the Egyptian Fatimid Caliph, Abu Ali al-Mansur, who purged Christians from prominent positions, banned Christian festivals, and desecrated the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The attack on Christian holy places, the interruption of Christian pilgrimages to the Holy Land, and the stunning success of the Seleuk Turks against the Byzantine Christians, all contributed to the calling of the First Crusade, its success resulting in the creation of Catholic Ultramar states, Edessa, Tripoli, 
Antioch, and Jerusalem. During the 12th century, the Crusaders occupied a commanding position in the Holy Land, until the rise of Salah al-Din and his conquest of Jerusalem, from which the Crusader states never truly recovered. Despite seven further Crusades, Acre, the final Outram Bastion, fell in 1291. As the Ottoman Turks crossed the Dardanelles Straits into Europe, Christian polities were forced to the extremities, Trebizond and Cyprus, though the Cypriot kings would hold fast to their claim as kings of Jerusalem. How fared the Christian populations after the failure of the Crusades? Dating back ostensibly to the original transfer of power in Egypt from the Byzantines to the Arabs, the Christians were bound by the Covenant of Umar. The Covenant provided the legal foundation for the treatment of the Dimis, the people of the book, with wider ramifications for Christians beyond Egypt to the whole patrimony of Islam. In essence, the building of new Christian places of worship was banned. Symbols of Christian devotion were banned or tolerated in modesty. Christians were disarmed and were expected to show deference to Muslims, from giving up their seats to ensuring that Christian houses were lower in elevation compared to their Muslim counterparts. Attempted Christian conversion of Muslims was strictly forbidden. Sumptuary laws ensured that Christians were made identifiable by their clothing. Then, as previously stated, there was the requirement of the jizya, the tribute. In return, Christians were permitted to retain their faith, albeit constricted, and the Muslim ruler was obligated to protect them, unless Christians attacked Muslims. Under these circumstances, one can appreciate why many ambitious Christians converted to Islam to avoid these restrictions, while the devout remained steadfast. Yet the covenant presupposed that the Muslim ruler would fulfil his obligations. Often this was not the case, and Christians had little recourse other than revolt. Christian religious leaders, like the Coptic Pope of Alexandria, for example, were either dependent on Muslim protection and favour, or effectively held hostage. Such was the motivation in forcing the Coptic Pope to relocate from Alexandria to the Muslim stronghold of Cairo. Moreover, the covenant assumed there will be a ruler capable of even providing protection. Written in the context of the first three caliphates, there was little anticipation of the rapid decline and disillusion of central authority throughout the Middle East in the 10th century. The Abbasids notoriously outsourced their protection to Ghulams, slave soldiers, invariably imported from Turkic tribes in Central Asia. Contrary to what can be assumed from the appellation of the word slave, Ghulams, Mamluks and Janissaries at time had the power to control or remove rulers at will, or failing that, run amok. Delegation of military command, coupled with an over-reliance on foreign soldiers and irregulars, who often expected payment in land, invariably compromised a Muslim ruler's ability to protect his Christian subjects, especially if doing so would negate the loyalty of his own troops. The benefits and weaknesses of this covenantal system would reach their apogee and nadir under the Ottoman Empire. But beyond the implications of Islamic overlordship, Oriental Christians and Muslims alike were the victims of something worse. Political disillusion and anarchy in the Middle East accompanied the advance of the Seljuk Turks, which in turn precipitated the First Crusade. Two Muslim states in the Middle East rose to restore order, Saladin's Ayyubids in Syria and the Khwarezmian Empire in Iran. When the Mongols arrived, they destroyed the Khwarezmians and sacked the Abbasid city of Baghdad. For a brief moment, it appeared that Muslim power in the Middle East had been broken, and it was none other than the Nestorian Christians who, though diminished, had religious and dynastic ties to the conquerors that the Muslims did not. 
Hulagu, the first Ilkhan, or Mongol ruler in Persia, took a Christian wife. Together with the Buddhists, the Nestorians were favoured by the old Mongol elite, and through their support, the Nestorian patriarch envisioned an alliance with the papacy to defeat the new Mamluk Sultanate in Egypt and reclaim the Holy Land for Christendom. Nevertheless, it was here that the Mongol advance was finally checked, thus banishing those hopes. Acre, the last Christian holdout, fell to the Mamluks shortly after. In the wake of this failed invasion of the Holy Land, the Mongols were assimilated into Islam, the dominant religion of their subjects. The Ilkhan, Ghazan, reversed the policies of his predecessors and began actively persecuting the Nestorians. After the fall of the Ilkhans came Tamerlane, a nomadic warlord from Central Asia. Tamerlane was lionised by his Christian contemporaries for his great victory over the Ottomans at Ankara, which almost certainly delayed the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople by half a century. What was almost universally overlooked by the jubilant Catholic and Orthodox onlookers was that Tamerlane was responsible for the near annihilation of the Church of the East. Outside of an enclave in India, the church was reduced to a few towns in Assyria, though even in Assyria, Tamerlane was responsible for destroying the ancient city of Assur. A century later, the remnant church split, the Chaldean church entering into communion with the Catholic church, and the Assyrian church claiming continuity with that of the old church of the east. In the Mameluk Sultanate of Egypt, the Mamluks, who had indirectly contributed to the fall of the Nestorians in the Ilkhanate, policy was aimed at ensuring that the Crusades could never establish a foothold in the Holy Land ever again. To that end, the Mamluks targeted the Maronites. The Maronites, after their patron, St. Moron, were a Syriac Christian community living in the mountains of Tarsus and Lebanon. When the First Crusade arrived, they contributed to the creation of the Crusader County of Tripoli, and thereafter entered into communion with the Catholic Church. They became the conduit between the Syriac and Latin-speaking Christian worlds. In the event that the Catholic Kingdom of Cyprus should invade the coast of the Levant, the Maronites would no doubt defect to the Christian cause. Accordingly, the Mamluks banished the Maronites from the coast. The Mamluks advanced into northern Syria, sacking the city of Antioch, while exploiting the divisions between Catholics, Syriacs and Greek Orthodox Christians. They then went on to eliminate the Christian presence in Armenian Kilikia. Though perhaps the most marked change in the status of Christians was in Egypt itself, where a combination of punitive measures, church closures, forced conversions, reduced Christians to 10% of the population. It is difficult to view the hardline policies of the Mamluks as anything other than a complete repudiation of the threats to Muslim dominance once posed by the Crusades and the Mongols at the expense of the remaining Christians. The demise of the Crusader states and the Byzantine Empire saw a massive influx of Christian slaves to the Middle East. The raids of the Turkish Seljuks in the 11th and 12th centuries captured tens of thousands of slaves from Mesopotamia, Assyria and Anatolia. Following the fall of the major crusader cities such as Edessa, the populations were typically enslaved en masse. Such was the case with the fall of Acre. Throughout the 14th century, Greek, Armenian and Syrian Christians were enslaved by Mamluks, Turks and Muslim pirates, where it evolved into a political custom for Middle Eastern rulers, a custom the Ottomans would inherit and refine.